I've often wondered why more jaw surgeons don't do infraorbital implants, which is to say zygomatic implants to bolster the midface. Mm-hmm. Seems to me like this is the tension right now when it comes to choosing jaw surgeons and designing and planning jaw surgeries. It's like no one wants to get that uh, bottom heavy so-called croc maxed or dog maxed look where the the jaws get punched forward, but the mid face is left be- left behind. Seems pretty straightforward that like, duh, you just bolster the mid face. And yet Dr. Gunson really seems to be the only surgeon in America, at least, who is doing dedicated infraorbital implants. Why is that? And what, you know, what do you think uh, of the role that those, that infraorbital implants play in aesthetics and jaw surgery? Yeah, uh, so I, I do them. Um, I do them a little bit different than Dr. Gunson. Uh, he's he's really good because uh, he does them with, uh, I think, some hydroxyapatite mix. Um, at least last, last I spoke with him. Um, That's correct, yes. Yeah. I do, I do uh, custom peak implants. So the implants that I design are, are custom 3D printed peak, peak implants. Um, Which is a kind of plastic? It's a medical grade plastic for, yeah, yeah. It's just trying to sound fancy, um, but it's a plastic. Um, it's 3D printed. Um, the reason I prefer it in my hands is that um, they, I can design them to fit around the maxillary hardware. So for example, I can make uh, negative indentations uh, within the peak implants so that they sit on the superior aspect of the maxillary plates. That'll allow me to know that they're sitting exactly where I want them to sit. Uh, so, where, where is that, doctor? Uh, the superior aspect of the maxillary plates with respect to the zygoma itself? Where, where are we talking? Yeah, so it depends on what kind of implant I'm designing, right? So the infraorbital ones are, are literally right below the orbital rim. Uh, I can show you some pictures of some of the ones I've designed in the past and you can maybe add it to the slide. I will do uh, so, please. Cool. Um, so sometimes we're gonna design infraorbital implants, sometimes I'm designing more malar implants to 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 go more in the zygomatic area. So it really depends on kind of where you're designing them and which part of the plate you'll engage. Generally, the maxillary plates you're gonna have uh, some component that's going to be along the piriform rim, and then you're going to have some that's on the zygomatic maxillary buttress area. So just depending on where the implant ends up going, you can design, uh, and where the implant is, you can design uh, the implant to fit along the plate. The benefit for me for the custom implants is that I can create uh, as much symmetry and harmony as possible, right? Because with the software that we have, I do you know custom orthognathic surgery. Um, you know, I can I can make the face as symmetrical as humanly possible with the number of pieces that I have to work with. And the implant just gives you an additional component to add symmetry, to add balance and harmony to the face. Like you said, if they're if they're hypoplastic um, in the mid face, if they're hypoplastic in the zygomatic areas, like you can bolster those areas. But what you can also do is mirror the other side. So you can you know, with the software, create an image and be like, okay, to get this side to be as mirror image to the other side, this implant should have, let's say, five millimeter thickness versus the other side should be a four millimeter thick implant or something like mm-hmm. that. So it just gives me a little bit more precision. Um, and, you know, in my surgeries, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be as precise as possible with all the movements, um, you know, uh, so... Um, I, I prefer in, in my hands, it just works a little bit better to have that computer guided symmetry and, and planning beforehand, before I go in the war. And are those peak implants just screwed right into the bone? Yeah. Yeah. And do they have any long-term negative impact? Like, do they, uh, I guess they would never sag like a silicone implant might. Cause they don't fastened. sag. They, they don't sag. Um, also, you know, the silicone implants can cause bone erosion over the years. I can't tell you how many of those that I see that people who had silicone implants placed in their chin because they were hypo, you know, they were retruded. And then you look at them 10, 15 years down the line and it almost looks like they have a giant cyst in their chin, but it's just bone erosion from the silicone over the years. So you don't get that with peak, um, you know, there's there's different implants, right? There's peak, there's medpore, there's silicone, like you said. You can use a hydroxy appetite uh, type of type of thing, but the peak for me tends to have the best quality in terms of um, 
God forbid, if you ever have to remove it, which I have not had to remove one yet, they're removable. They don't, they don't, uh, scar into the tissue like a med pore implant would they don't cause bone erosion like a silk uh, a silicone implant would but you get that long-term stability and you have the you know the precision of it being 3d printed and, and kind of patient specific it's made just for that patient so it fits snugly against their anatomy and recreates exactly what you want yeah, I've seen them. They're certainly beautiful in in the way that they can be perfectly contoured to the patient's bone, just like a custom plate can. Uh, the one thing that I've heard argued against peak in favor of the uh, hydroxyapatite implants that, say, Dr. Gunson does is that because they're less biointegrated and because they get less uh, blood flow to them and do not actually become part of the natural body, that there's a higher infection risk. Can you comment on that? Um, I think once you go through your initial he your initial healing phase, um, and the wounds are healed and everything's sealed off, you know it's just like any other implanted thing in the body, right? So you know people get cervical disc replacements. Maybe you have to be cautious for the first few years until the body really like seals everything off and. Mm -hmm and stuff, but, um, I wouldn't say there's a lifelong risk of infection. Uh, it's very much a front loaded risk of, Hey, once the body accepts that this is not an intruder, it sort of just backs off. Yes. 